Okay, I think we can we can we can get going uh, now. So um, my name is Michael Collins, and I'm the Director General of the IAEA, and we're delighted to welcome you to this uh, uh, lunchtime IAEA seminar, and uh, delighted in particular to be joined uh, uh, by former Downing Street Chief of Staff Jonathan Powell, uh, who will speak to us uh, shortly. But we're very fortunate and very glad that Jonathan could uh, spend this time with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, to talk about the British government and um, handling generally of the COVID-19 crisis and its wider implications for issues like Brexit and, 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 and indeed issues beyond that. Um, Jonathan uh, will speak to us for about uh, 20 minutes and then we will go, well, maybe we'll have a short conversation and then go into questions and answers with our members who are joining us. And you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom which you should see on your screens. Um, please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session uh, as they occur to you, and we will come to them, as I say, once Jonathan has finished his own presentation. Uh, a gentle reminder, if I may, that today's presentation is on the record, uh, while the Q&A will take place under Chatham House rules, meaning that you can use the information uh, but cannot attribute it to the person who said it or where it was said. These are our normal rules and they Will apply again for this webinar. Um, just also, if you would like to do so, please uh, uh, tweet in relation to these uh, proceedings using the handle iiea.com. Uh, we'd be very glad, obviously, if we could uh, magnify uh, through the medium of, of, of Twitter and other social media um, the, the, the part of this proceedings, or particularly the part of these proceedings that are on the record. Uh, Jonathan Powell, I've known for many, many, many years, uh, um, working with him very closely on the peace process over a six-year period when I was working uh, in the Department of the Taoiseach. But more particularly, he served as Chief of Staff uh, to Prime Minister uh, Tony Blair from 1997 to 2007, during which time he also served as Chief British Negotiator on the Northern Ireland peace process, as I said, playing an instrumental, indeed a crucial, vital uh, role in bringing about the peace that Northern Ireland enjoys today, whatever its imperfections, it is a piece that obviously is there and we're very, very uh, pleased that that's the case. So prior to joining uh, Prime Minister Blair or prior to joining uh, Tony Blair, uh, he was uh, a British diplomat for 16 years and he is currently founder and director of Intermediate, uh, a charity focused on ending armed conflict around the world. He is the author of several books, uh, including, of course, uh, one in relation to the peace process called Great Hatred, Little Room, Making Peace in Northern Ireland, which was published in 2008. Uh, and thereafter, he's gone on to publish at least two other books. One, uh, The New Machiavelli, How to Wield Power in the Modern World, which was published in 2010. And uh, more laterally, uh, Talking to Terrorists, How to End Armed Conflict, which was published in 2013, 2014, I beg your pardon. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Jonathan. Uh, just to extend to a very, very warm welcome uh, uh, to, to, to Dublin through this medium uh, and uh, to look forward to hearing what he has to say and picking up the conversation and the Q&A thereafter. So Jonathan, over to you. Thank you, Michael, and uh, good afternoon to everyone from, from London. It's a real pleasure to be with Michael again. Uh, Michael and I worked very closely together on the Northern Ireland peace process for many years. And I really like to pay real tribute to the work of Michael and his colleagues in the Taoiseach's office, in the DFA, Department of the Justice and elsewhere, there would not have been a, uh, a successful peace process without the work that they put in and the ideas they came up with. I'm extremely grateful to that, uh, even now. Uh, as Michael says, I was Tony Blair's chief of staff. I, I can't claim to have any expertise on coronavirus, so if you want me to consult about your uh, symptoms, I will be of no use at all. What I can talk a bit about is handling crises from Number 10 Downing Street. I uh, was Chief of Staff for, for 10 years while Tony was Prime Minister and uh, a few years before that when he was in the opposition. So I have some experience of dealing with crises, rather different sort of crises, but we had the foot and mouth crisis that was really quite serious and forced us to postpone the elections. We had the fuel crisis before that that nearly brought the country to a grinding halt. So I guess I have some perspective on the politics of this uh, and the way that things are being handled from Number 10 Downing Street. In, in terms of questions afterwards, happy to talk about anything you like. I think if I look at the role played by the British government so far, I would have to say they're in the middle of the pack. They're certainly worse than Germany, worse than you in Ireland, and worse than Norway, for example. But at least we look a little bit better than the United States and Belarus, uh, if we compare ourselves with them. Uh, the NHS has done very well. I mean, sometimes 
uh, the role of a centralized health system is played down. But I have to say, in these circumstances, that central control really comes into its own. The ability to put together those Nightingale hospitals so quickly has been quite remarkable. Uh, and the ability to flatten the curve by suddenly transferring the resources into COVID. It's been a problem for people with heart attacks and cancer and so on. But in, just in terms of response, that has done well. I'm afraid I'd have to say that our politicians have done a bit less well. So far, that isn't registered in the polls. What happens in a crisis like this is that people rally to the flag, as they say in America. They come to support the prime minister and the government. They want them to succeed and they don't want too much criticism. So support for Boris Johnson has gone up. Uh, people want the problem solved. Far in talking about his return from hospital at Easter, about a second coming. I think that's probably uh, rather over-egging it, but they do seem to see it in those sort of terms. Now questions are beginning to be raised. First of all, they had a, a free ride as the government in dealing with the crisis. Many of you will have seen the story in the Sunday Times uh, last week, where it was pointed out that Boris Johnson had missed five COBRA meetings at the beginning of this crisis. The COBRA meeting is where all the ministers come together, all the civil servants, to deal with the crisis. It's not unheard of for ministers not to go to COBRA. Prime ministers don't always attend. But to miss that many uh, when he was in London at the beginning of a crisis, I think is a sign that they were failing to take it seriously enough. They were uh, too relaxed at the beginning. And I think the response at the moment is beginning to uh, unravel, particularly we see in terms of social care and the old people's homes that we have where they do not provide the equipment or the support that is necessary. Um, we finally got a political opposition in London. It's about three years too late, but uh, it's a loyal opposition. It's one that is going to question. And uh, Keir Starmer uh, has had very good reviews for his first prime minister's questions. He is a barrister. He's very good at um, posing questions about being forensic. And I think uh, Boris Johnson, when he returns to the Commons, will find he's having a much harder time than he did before. And I think the questions that Keir is putting about the slow response in locking down, about the slow provision of PPE and ventilators, about the failure to join in the EU procurement exercise, and asking for uh, their views on how we're going to actually exit from this, uh, are going to be difficult for them to answer, and they will, um, will struggle a bit. Now, I am sympathetic to the government in these circumstances. It is very difficult. We were definitely very slow when we had the foot and mouth uh, outbreak. I remember being called uh, with Tony Blair in Washington DC by Nick Brown, who was our agriculture minister at the time, and sa him saying they were going to lock down all movement of cattle and sheep in the United Kingdom from that moment. And thinking, gosh, that's a react overreaction. This is just a normal foot and mouth outbreak. But actually, we were too late. And if there's one thing I learned in number 10, you have to move straight away on these things. The longer you leave it, the worse it will get. I did a BBC program with Nick Robinson immediately after this crisis began, and I was with all the scientists and experts. And one question he asked us was, if you had an outbreak in Stoke, would you lock the city down or would you leave it open? And I have to say, the six scientists there and experts all said, no, no, we'd leave it open. I was the only person to say, lock it down. And I said that not because I have any expertise, but because the one thing I learned is, you've got to get ahead of this thing. If you're going to control it, then that's what you have to do. So while I'm sympathetic, I do think that this has played into Boris Johnson's weaknesses. He is, to be honest, pretty lazy. He is a libertarian. He does not want to lock things down. He doesn't want to tell people what to do. He doesn't really enjoy detail. And I think he made a mistake at the beginning of not taking it seriously. Being on holiday with his fiancée at Chevening is not an excuse for not gripping something like this. And the speech he made at Cheltenham, sorry, the speech he made at Greenwich, while allowing the Cheltenham races to go ahead was again a mistake in underestimating the importance of this. The problem we have now is we're kind of the opposite of you in Dublin. In Dublin you have a Taoiseach, a Prime Minister who's a doctor, and we have a Prime Minister who's a patient. And that's quite a big difference in the way that we try and handle this. And it's a real problem in our system not having a Prime Minister in place. In, uh, we do not have a presidential system, but this stuff about cabinet government is nonsense. It hasn't existed since Mrs. Thatcher, at least. You can't leave it to cabinet to come to a consensus on every issue. You need to have someone who can set the uh, answer and then try and argue for it and persuade his cabinet colleagues. And that's going to be particularly important as we try and 
get out of the lockdown and uh, exit from the crisis. Without him there, it's going to be very hard. They'll have to think about bringing someone else in if he doesn't come back. They're now briefing that he'll be back on Monday. And that, by the way, is another of their problems, that they have spent too much time briefing things to the newspapers. Dominic Cummings has been there uh, sharing it in that way. And that is not the right thing to do uh, if you are going to really communicate clearly with people. And they've had some very muddled messages as they've gone along. They also have a problem of having a very weak bench. They've appointed the Brexiteers, not the traditional Tories, and they've appointed people who are loyal to Boris Johnson. And that has left them without the sort of people who they can easily put in front of the TV cameras. Pretty Patel, for example, has been hidden away apart from one uh, disastrous outing. And many of the other ministers have simply failed to explain uh, what, will, uh, what will happen. You need to have someone who makes the decisions and someone who can explain. I remember Bill Clinton saying to Tony Blair, uh, I think it was actually after 9-11, your job is explainer in chief. You've got to go out there, explain to people, keep their confidence, show they have a plan. And we haven't got anyone doing that in Britain at the moment. And that is a serious problem. Uh, Dominic Cummings, I'm afraid, has also been, uh, been sick, quite seriously sick, according to newspapers today. He's come back now. He is the master of three word slogans and three word slogans do help when you're trying to communicate a message. But there is a problem with the central control he tries to impose from number 10. We were accused in our time of being very centralizing, very controlling of government. But actually, if you look at us by comparison with what he's tried to do with the Treasury, what he's tried to do with other ministries, we were positively lackadaisical. And I think if you, everything is controlled out of number 10, when you run into a crisis like this and the prime minister gets sick, you have a serious problem in steering the uh, ship of state. Now, I want to focus in particular on what they've been doing in terms of saying that uh, this all depends on the science. All they're doing is listening to the scientists and implementing what the scientists say. But scientists are not Moses and they're not interpreting tablets of stone that have come down to them. You have different views from different scientists. You know, the editor of The Lancet will have a very different view from your chief medical officer or your chief scientific officer. And we discovered that in the foot and mouth crisis. We had our chief scientific officer, who was David King, and then we had a lot of other scientists who were telling us what we should do is vaccinate the sheep and the cows. And I remember Prince Charles weighing in with those scientists and saying the government must vaccinate. Had we vaccinated, we'd have had a real problem because uh, those cows and sheep would have been, un we couldn't have sold them in the EU at that point. Uh, had we gone down that scientific route, it would have been a real dead end. So you have to listen to one scientist, decide their right, and then stick with them, which is what we did with David King. He described to us the modeling, but done by the same modelers at Imperial, that showed us the foot and mouth uh, outbreak going up like this, an almost vertical line. If we took the measures he suggested, which was locking down, it would go flat and then it would come down again. And the model certainly followed it going up and we were absolutely terrified, uh, but then it uh, did go flat, more or less when he said it would go flat and came down remarkably quickly. So you can't just blame it on the scientist. You have to actually uh, interpret it yourself from the advice that they give you. We're now moving on to the question of the, the exit. How do we get out of this? And you, of course, in, I think in Ireland will probably get out of it before us by the looks of things because you've had a, a better uh, experience altogether than we have. And this will be a very difficult decision. It will not be easy to persuade people to leave their homes. Having persuaded them to go in and be safe, you have to persuade them something is different out there for them to be persuaded to go back out again. Uh, and the position the government has taken up to now of not discussing this and not being prepared to even uh, reveal in any way how they're going to make the decision about exit has been a really serious problem. Uh, if we don't have the vaccine, and we clearly won't have the vaccine by the time we have to come out of this, uh, I hope it's speeding up and God willing, we'll have the vaccine by next year. Uh, if we have no testing, we're now aiming for 100,000 tests a day for people who have the disease, but we're actually going to need the tests that haven't yet been invented uh, to show if you've already had the disease to get things back up and running. And we don't have, we're nowhere near getting those. The other thing is we will almost certainly, all of us, get a second peak um, when we come out of this. And the question really will be how serious it is. I don't want to keep comparing it to foot and mouth because I know we, you know we killed all the cows and sheep and that's a very different sort of thing. But we did get a second peak. We knew we would. We went back up again. Luckily, we were expecting it. It was controlled, we knew how to deal with it. In this case, the danger is the second peak is not going to be controlled. What we will do in Britain, I think, is probably follow others. We won't be the first out, 
We'll see what happens to you. We'll see what happens in Norway, see what happens in Germany. Germany, of course, has many advantages over us because of their regime on testing. Uh, they're now here adopting the mantra of uh, test and trace, but that was the one they rejected at the beginning when they decided to go for the um, herd uh, immunity approach, which they then backed off because the numbers showed how many would die. The other thing that's been quite interesting in the recent developments is the, um, uh, the way the nations have gone their different ways. That so far, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland have stuck together with the London government. They're all on the Central Committee, they're all on COBRA, they're part of the decision making. They're now beginning to separate. Um, uh, Nicola Sturgeon made a very good speech in which she said she was going to treat the population like adults. She was going to explain her thinking, explain how she was going down the path towards exit. Uh, the Welsh have done the same thing. Uh, Arlene Foster, I noticed this morning, is now calling for Northern Ireland to leave earlier than the uh, rest of the UK, which I must say brought back to my mind Ian Paisley coming into Tony Blair's uh, study uh, during the foot and mouth crisis, banging the table and saying, our people may be British, but our cows are Irish, because he wanted the cows to be able to move in the same way they were in the rest of Ireland. Uh, so we now see the nations pulling in different directions. And this will have implications not just for this crisis, but for what comes uh, after this as well. Of course, the biggest uh, implications, apart from those of, uh, of the very sad deaths that we've experienced and the very serious illnesses, is for the economy. And here the question is so huge, it's very difficult to even get your mind around it, let alone. Uh, explore um, uh, what the implications are. Rishi Sunak, our newish uh, Chancellor, has certainly um, done well. He's been seen as a very good communicator. Uh, he's moved very fast with the Treasury machinery to get uh, policies in place. There have been some snarling over things like loans, which is, I think, understandable. Uh, but it, and it is extraordinary to see, uh, as Jeremy Corbyn has pointed out, the Tory party embarking on huge spending and huge um, loans and huge, even moving in the direction of a universal basic income as the only way to deal with uh, the self-employed and those in the gig economy. Now, some in the government are still hoping for a V-shaped recovery, that we will come out of this, demand will come back and push it back. I think the problem is that um, so many firms will go out of business that it will be very difficult to get that kind of recovery. So many people will be unemployed, it will be very difficult to get that kind of recovery. Uh, I think there will be, obviously, there will be a recovery. We don't know what it will be like. The other thing worth commenting on, I think, is the inquiry that we'll have after this. You know, after the Iraq War, we had the Chilcot inquiry. Uh, earlier in the, we had the Hutton inquiry. There will be an inquiry into this. It will be, obviously, long after the decisions have been made. I think what the Conservative government seem to be doing are twofold. One is they are trying to set up Matthew Hancock uh, for the uh, fall on this, the health minister who has been very um, glib in his promises and less good in delivering them, although I think on testing he may be able to do it. And the other thing I think they're setting up is to blame the scientists, to say it's the scientists who misled us. Uh, uh, scientists are beginning to fight back in their briefing and I don't think that will come out well for them. I think that the uh, inquiry will be bad for the government, but it will be so late that it will have a very little uh, impact on, on uh, it'll have impact on politics later on, but little impact on these immediate events. If I turn to some of the consequences uh, of this, and this is all very speculative because we don't really know how this ends or how this impacts. It's pretty clear is on Brexit that although the government is insisting there'll be no delay, they won't ask for a delay, they won't accept a request from the EU for a delay, I think a delay will be forced upon them. I don't see how they could conceivably, given the negotiations have only just restarted, uh, they're being done uh, online. I, I, there's no way they could be ready by June uh, to know that by December they'd be in a position to leave. And leaving without a deal in this weak and economic position would be catastrophic. So I, don't, I think this is all bluster, as we've seen from uh, Boris Johnson before in his negotiations. Besides anything else, the civil servants are all working on coronavirus. They've all been moved over from Brexit and everything else. So there isn't anyone working on this subject. Um, to do it. We, maybe we should discuss in the, the uh, discussion rather than now, but the Northern Ireland border, I fear, will come back again, because it's clear from what Boris Johnson said before that he uh, wants to reopen the question of whether there will be a border, uh, as he conceded, between the uh, rest of the UK and Northern Ireland, uh, which is a real problem for unionists, but is much better than the, what he was proposing before. So maybe we should discuss that there. Now, people say very glibly that uh, the world will never be the same after this crisis, but if you look back at Spanish flu, actually Spanish flu had remarkably little um, impact in changing the world. The First World War had an impact, but Spanish flu did not. 
the only way this will change things is if people do something about it. The reason the world, at least Britain, changed in 1945 was because people had prepared during the war a series of really radical ideas. We had beverage uh, with unemployment benefit, we had the National Health Service, we had universal education. Actually, some of them drawn up by Tories, some by Liberals, but those were there and the Labour government in 45 put them into place. Unless we have those ideas in place, the world will revert to normal very, very quickly uh, and we won't get um, those, those remarkable changes as in 45. So I hope people will start thinking in that sort of way. Secondly, I think that uh, experts are certainly back. The, pre the government has spent a lot of time attacking experts. Uh, Michael Gove has said we don't need them anymore. They certainly did need them and they've been depending on them very much, not just scientists, but civil servants and others who've been uh, working on these things. I think big government is back in quite a serious way. I think it's very hard to see, uh, given what's happened economically, how government can retreat very quickly from this back to a Thatcherite approach of, of pulling back. Thirdly, I think solidarity, uh, an old fashioned word is, is back in place, certainly here in Britain, I'm sure in Ireland too, there's been a great outbreaking of solidarity with people trying to support each other in these circumstances. I think, as I say, the universal basic income is something that we might uh, uh, see back on the table in a serious way now, because uh, if even a, a Tory government is introducing it, there will be a lot of support for that. There'll be a huge um, hangover, fiscal and monetary hangover we're going to have to deal with. How are we going to pay for this? How do we make paying for it fair? We just put it all on income tax that's not going to be very fair if we put it on VAT or other indirect taxes and uh, national insurance that's not going to be very fair are we going to start taxing capital or are we going to find other ways in which we can raise the money uh, to repay some of this I think as Michael and I were discussing before we'll see more of what we're doing today more working from home and my day job now is working on armed conflicts around the world and I basically spend all my time on airplanes I'm obviously not doing that now so I spend my entire time on my laptop uh, talking to presidents or prime ministers or guerrilla leaders in different countries by Zoom. And it's remarkable how quickly they've adapted. I think we'll see government and business adapt to many more people staying at home and working from home. And we're actually, at least in my experience, you get a lot more out of people because they don't even get coffee breaks or, or the commuting time. They work all the time. Uh, and I think um, we'll have to do something about thinking through how we deal with the next threat. We all knew a pandemic was coming. Uh, we knew it would be serious. Uh, we did a certain amount of preparing for it, but we were not prepared. We will need to be prepared for the next threat. May not be a pandemic. What are we going to do about China? How are we going to deal with the issue of surveillance that's now become acceptable? Uh, what are we going to do about global warming? Those sort of questions we'll really uh, have to start dealing with. What about uh, AI and its impact on jobs where it will be destroying jobs? I think it will make us a bit more serious. I think it could go the way of populist politics and um, uh, people like um, the Hungarian leader Orban taking us in a particular direction, or it could go to people actually wanting more boring leaders who are more serious, who are addressing uh, the real questions, we'll see. So lastly, to wrap up, um, I think it's very interesting that here we faced a global challenge, and yet we have failed very badly in terms of international as individual countries. The EU had a plan, a policy, a committee, but actually the EU failed to bring people together. France acted as France, Italy acted as Italy. We need to have a review of that. If we face a global problem like this, surely we must find some way that we can cooperate better together. Uh, there will be tensions, people pulling back and Trump trying to blame it on the Chinese. But I think those of us who are serious about trying to address these questions need to think, how do we get the international system better capable of dealing with global problems like this. Global warming is the obvious example, but there needs to be a real way of dealing with it. So in conclusion, I think that will be a really important point in the agenda. And one subsection of that will be UK Irish affairs. Uh, after Michael and I's time in government, where we work together so closely, really British and Irish relations have been very good until the Brexit negotiations. They really rode the coach and horses through them, sadly, which pretty much 98%, if not 99% of the fault was on our side. How do we go about rebuilding that, particularly if we have to carry on with the Brexit negotiations and things like the border are reopened? But I'm optimistic. I do believe we've reached a new stage now in our relations. It'll be very hard to turn that clock back. So I'm optimistic that this crisis uh, and indeed even Brexit will not have a long term impact on British Irish relations, but we'll find ourselves in a much better position. So to, to end, I think that I have sympathy for the government and these problems. They've not handled it well. They will pay a price eventually in an inquiry. But now it's important that, particularly on this exiting from the crisis, 
uh, they have clear leadership, clear communication, and if possible, bringing in some outside people, businessmen, people with practical experience who can run some of these things for them. That would be the sensible thing to do. Michael, thank you very much. I'll stop there and happy to engage in any questions.